So our text for this morning is Genesis 37, the verses 1 through 11. You'll find that on page 31. This will be our, our text for this morning. So Genesis 37, verses 1 through 11. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. So far. In response to the proclamation of the gospel, we'll sing from the provisional song, which is How Bright Appears the Morning Star. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, think about the last time you watched a, a school play or a live theater production. Maybe it was one at, at Guido, Debray School, or maybe at, at, at JCS, or maybe at a, a, a local theater in Hamilton somewhere. And think about all those, those nice chairs, the nice red chairs that are in the building. Think of the, the beautiful red curtains that cover everything, the magnificent sets the actors in all their interesting clothes. Think about everything that goes into a play. So when you watch a play, what we see is we see the actors and we see the set. The curtain opens and that's what we see. But what we don't see is what's going on behind the scenes, or at least if the play is running as it should, you shouldn't see what's going on behind the scenes. But it's actually what's going on behind the scenes with the stagehands who are bringing all the props in and out and doing up all the makeup of all the different actors. They're the ones that actually keep the play going. They're the ones that are actually the reason that the play is all possible. But all we see is just the action in front of us. What we see in a way is just the tip of of the iceberg. And our text today is, is very similar. At first glance, all we see is these actors on the stage, you could say. We see this set, and we see, what we see is dysfunction, we see favoritism, we see hatred, we see jealousy, we just see this sort of mess. And then on top of that, we have no reference to God whatsoever. There is no reference to God. The author just simply moves from one thing to the next. He says, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. But when we look closer at what we have here, we see that in all the mess of Jacob's family, that there, is, that there is more going on. That what we see, there's actually something going on behind the scenes. God is working amid all that dysfunction. And he's pointing to the future star of Jacob. And so that is our, our theme. Amid all the dysfunction of Jacob's family, God points to the future star of Jacob. And we will uh, look into this. By looking at the following themes. First, we'll see Joseph and how he's treated like a star. Second, we'll see how he's dreaming of stars. And then third, we'll look at the dawning of the morning star. 
So firstly then, treated like a star. Now before we dive right into our text, we need to zoom out a little bit and see the bigger picture. As many of you know, Genesis is a book of beginnings. That's what the word Genesis means. It's, a, it's about the beginnings of the world, about the beginnings of man, about the beginnings of nations as well. It's, all about, it's about all these different beginnings. And we see that with the repetition of the phrase, these are the generations of. And, you'll, and you read that ten times throughout the book of Genesis. It comes back time and time again. We read about the generations of Noah. We read about, firstly, the generations of the, of the world. Then we have the generations of Shem, of Abraham, Isaac, Esau, and then Jacob. So it's about all these generations. And so what is the author trying to accomplish with this? What is the Holy Spirit doing here? Well, what, it, what he's doing is he's tracking the blessings from Adam through to Abraham. The promise, the, all those blessings, the promise of the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent. The promise of a great nation. The promise of um, the blessing and protection that God would give to his people. And so the writer is tracking all those blessings from Adam through to Abraham through to Jacob. And we see this in our text. It says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. So why is this important? Well, it's important because the generations of Jacob is the highlight of the book of Genesis. In a way, everything is going up to that point. And it's showing the Israelites, who were the first readers of of Genesis, it's showing them who who they are. And more than that, it's showing them where they've come from. They are descendants of the sons of Jacob, the founding father of the nation of Israel. And this is key, because often when we read uh, the story of Joseph, especially from Genesis 37 through to the end, we can think that it's all about Joseph, but it's not. It's about Joseph and his brothers. It's about how God is dealing with Jacob's whole family, not just one singular person. It's about the generations of Jacob, the heirs of, the, of God's covenant blessings to Jacob, to whom God promised that nations and kings would come from them, and whom God promised that he would give the land of promise. And so it meant that the Israelites, who were, who were heirs of Jacob, who were descendants of Jacob, it meant that they, by extension, were also re- recipients of the blessings. They would receive those blessings as well. And so this is what the writer's doing as he's working his way through Genesis. He's tracking all these blessings. Now, with that in mind, we can go back to our, our text this morning. Now, verse 3 kind of throws us all into, into the middle of everything. We're introduced to Joseph, this young man, and we're introduced to Joseph and his relationship with the brothers, but also his relationship with his father. So firstly, we read about Joseph, and, and Joseph is a 17-year-old boy, And he's a shepherd assistant of his older half-brothers, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And these, as you may recall from what we just read in Genesis 35, they were the children of Zilpah and Bilnah, the maidservants of Leah and Rachel. Now one day, while he's assisting his brothers in the field, he comes back to his father with a bad report. We're not told exactly what the brothers did. We're just simply told that it it was something wrong. He brings back a bad report. He goes and tells his dad. And as we can imagine, the brothers are not very happy with this at all. You see, the brothers had this sort of, you could say, Vegas attitude of what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens on the field stays on the field. And so they thought that Joseph was indeed tattletaling on them, and no older brother likes to be tattletailed on. And so we see a rift that's just starting to emerge between the brothers that's starting to break down their relationship with them. So that's Joseph, and that's his relationship with his brothers. And then we see Joseph's relationship with his father, and that's completely different. Jacob loves Joseph. So much so that his affection for his young son is more than his affection for all his his sons. Twice the passage tells us Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his sons. And This love and special favoritism was public knowledge. Everyone could see that Jacob loved Joseph. 
And what is interesting is that this, this special love and affection for Joseph doesn't just start in Genesis 37, but actually begins a lot earlier. And we can see it in Genesis 33. So in that passage, you have Jacob and he hears about Esau. And you might remember from Esau and Jacob that Esau wanted to kill Jacob because he had deceived him and taken his blessing from his father. And so Jacob gets word that Esau is coming and he's expecting this bloodbath. And so he starts arranging his, his household as they, they start to approach Esau. And what is kind of interesting is that we see that Jacob tucks Rachel and Joseph in the back of the caravan, leaving Leah and the other brothers closer to the front. So apparently they were somewhat expendable. And then this favoritism only grows in our passage. So think about it from the brothers' perspective. First, they're, they're in that position, wondering why they're closer in the front of the caravan, while Rachel and Joseph are tucked further back. And now we get to this passage, and we see his favoritism again. Jace, Joseph was, was treated like a star. And this special favoritism overflowed with special gifts. We read, now, Jacob... Now, Jacob gave a colorful robe to his son, Joseph. It says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all any of other his sons, and he made him a robe of many colors. Now, this colorful robe was more than just a nice gift. It wasn't as though Jacob was just giving a nice gift to his son, like a bike or something. There, there was something, there's more to that gift than just that. So the robe was a special robe. It was a colorful robe or an ornate robe. It was a long-sleeved robe. It was a kind that, that would go from all the way down the wrist and then all the way down to the ankles. It was the kind of coat that a noble person would wear. And we find this in 2 Samuel 13 verse 18 where the same phrase is used. David's daughter was wearing a long robe with sleeves for this is what the king's virgin daughters used to wear. So it was a very special robe. It was a robe of distinction that marked someone else out as royalty. So by giving Joseph this robe, Jacob was unintentionally or intentionally, we don't know, but he was marking Joseph out as one who is privileged in the family. Or so it seemed. And that just added oxygen to the flame. The brothers didn't like this one bit. We read, but when the brothers saw that, the, that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him. The brothers loathed him. And it wasn't just the four brothers who were out in the field that got a bad report, but it was all of the brothers. Their hatred was so intense that it says they could not speak peacefully to him. They couldn't even talk nicely, harmoniously, brother to a brother. There was, it was so intense that they couldn't even give the Hebrew greeting shalom. We could imagine it like this. The dysfunction in this family was so bad that if Joseph walked into the room, say, to the breakfast table, his brothers would completely ignore him. They wouldn't even look at him. That's how intense their hatred was for their brother. Now, brothers and sisters, before we move on and have a look at the dreams that Joseph has, note the damage that is caused by favoritism here. The special love and favor that Jacob had for Joseph, while it's understandable to a degree, it was very foolish because Jacob should have known better. As many of you would recall, the same thing happened in Jacob's family with devastating consequences. It ripped the house to shreds. In Genesis 25 verse 28, we read that Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game and Rebekah loved Jacob. And then they started pitting one against the other. And what was the outcome of their favoritism? Well, it was hatred and it was deceit. And the same thing happens here. Isaac, so we have Isaac's favoritism that led to hatred and deceit. And what we're about to see is Jacob's favoritism leading to a greater crop of, of hatred and deceit. So this is a word to the parents, teachers, business owners, to anyone who, who is here that is in a position of authority. Because you may have it that 
you get along with maybe one of your students very well or, or one of your, of your children or even one of your employees much better than the others. You may have it that you get along with them and maybe it's because they remind you of yourself or maybe it's because they have similar interests that you can relate to or maybe it's because of their disposition. They just have a nice, nice character and it's easier to get along with them. But whatever happens, it's tempting then to mark them as someone of special interest to you to be more interested in their lives in the lives of your other children or your other employees or your other students, to give them special attention. And so what, are, what the author is highlighting to us is just don't do it. Because you might be unwittingly creating and sowing seeds of dysfunction in your family that could rupture it a shreds later on. So next we see that Joseph is dreaming of stars. So we see this dysfunction and discord that's kind of brewing in in the family, and then it only gets worse. Their hatred for Joseph only increases. One day, Joseph comes to his brothers with a dream. We don't know if he was excited or worried about the dream that he had, but whatever his attitude, he describes it vividly. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it, bowed down to my sheaf. So you have behold this, behold that. It's it's like Joseph saying, guys, listen to this dream that I had. So there we were out in the field. My sheaf was upright. Yours was on the ground, bowing down to me. So he tells it vividly. Now, we don't know what his attitude was towards the dreams, as we mentioned, but we definitely know how the brothers interpreted it. They thought that by telling them this dream, that Joseph was announcing to them that he was going to rule over them. And the brothers were fuming. So first, this kid throws them under the bus before their dad by telling them a bad report. And then he gets this nice kingly robe from his father, showing just how much daddy loves him more than all his brothers. And now he has the audacity to tell them that he's going to rule over them. It's like, who does he think he really is? And you hear that in their response. They said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? You could put it differently. You don't really think that that you will rule over us, do you? You don't really think that you will have dominion over us. Who in the world do you think you are? This dream was enough. Twice the passage mentions that they hated him all the more. They hated him because of his dreams. They hated him because of his words. They simply had enough. They saw nothing more in the dreams. They had enough of the dreams and they had enough of Joseph. But then Joseph has another dream. He dreamed another dream. And this time he wasn't dreaming about wheat fields. He was dreaming about stars. So again, we can imagine Joseph coming down to the breakfast table with a second dream. And with the same vivid language, he tells them, Look, I've dreamed another dream. There they were, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars. And guess what? They're all bowing down to me. Now, the image of the sun, moon, and stars is not a coincidence. It's true that anything goes in a dream, and many of you will know that. Maybe you woke up this morning and you said, guys, listen to the dream that I had. It was very strange or whatever. Like, we don't often ascribe significance to what we see in our dreams. We just dream them. But that's not so with this. This wasn't just any dream. And so the images that appear are very important. As, as you re- will recall, that in Genesis 1... God made the sun, the moon, and the stars. And he says that the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night. It says, and God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars. And then later in the Bible, these these heavenly lights, these heavenly bodies become a picture of human rule and human power. And often you see this in the prophecies of the of, um the exile, or before the exile, that the prophets cast the downfall of kingdoms and rulers as the extinguishing of of lights, of stars, and heavenly bodies. We see that in Ezekiel uh, 32, for example. And so this dream spoke of a sort of authority of the highest order. 
So God gave these lights to rule the day. And now in this dream, these ruling lights, these great bodies that represent the, the brothers and, and his father and mother, are now bowing down to Joseph. So the first dream spoke of supremacy over his brothers. And now the second dream speaks out of, of his rule over not only his house, but and beyond. And so their hatred turns into this blazing sort of jealousy. We read in verse 11, and his brothers were jealous of him. And the word here, jealous, speaks of emotion that is much deeper than just hatred. In various passages in the Bible, it speaks of, of a feeling or emotion that is liable to spill over into violent action. Think of James chapter 4 in his letter. He says, you desire and you do not have. And then what is the outcome of that? You murder. You covet and you cannot obtain. And so you fight and you quarrel. So this word is just waiting for something to happen. It's kind of setting us up for the next part of the story. And so what we see is the powder is in the keg. And all we're waiting for is a little spark to just set everything off. Brothers and sisters, the hatred and jealousy of the brothers blinded them. They should have realized that something more was going on here. But they, they couldn't see more than that. All they saw was this, these dreams and they saw this boy who had these, these selfish ambitions. Because think about it, the brothers would have heard of the promises that God had get, gave to Jacob. Jacob would have told his sons about all those promises that they were recipients of as heirs. And so none of those things factored in. Instead, all they saw was just this selfish, this prideful, ambitious kid. But it should have given them pause for thought. Now, now Jacob did set them up for this in terms of his favoritism for, for Joseph. But they should have had reason for, for thought. Because dreams were no small thing. In this time of, of redemptive history, God often revealed himself in dreams. Think of Genesis 20, where God comes to Abimelech, he comes to him in a dream. Or think of Genesis 31, where Jacob says that the angel of God appeared to him in a dream. And so it should have been evident to them that there was something, there was something more to this, especially, especially because he had the dream not once, but twice. Different images, but it's the same dream, essentially. You could say once is a coincidence, but twice. That's important. And we know this because of later on in Genesis 41, where Joseph appears to Pharaoh, and we're told that the doubling of dreams meant that a dream was fixed by God. Joseph says to Pharaoh in Genesis 41, he says, and the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. So God was indirectly revealing his will for the future of Jacob's, Jacob's family. But the brothers were too blind to see it. The thought never crossed their minds. But the thought did cross Jacob's mind. And that brings us to the last thing we'll, we'll look into. So verse 11, And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Joseph, Jacob kept the saying in mind. Now that wasn't his first reaction to Jake, uh, Joseph's second dream. When Joseph told him the second dream, his, his reaction was actually much like the brothers. He wasn't impressed at all. He says, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Do you really think that I and your mother and your brothers will bow down with our face to the ground before you? Come on, Joseph. That's, just, that's quite enough of that. That was his first reaction. His first reaction was to tell him off. But then, while the brothers were seething with jealousy, we read that Jacob kept the saying in mind. He pondered them. It's almost like Jacob was sitting in his chair at night, reflecting on Joseph's dreams, thinking about how the brothers reacted to them, thinking about God's promises that he had made to, to Jacob. And then it dawned on him that maybe there was something more to this than what meets the eye. It dawned on him that what he saw was maybe just the tip of the iceberg, that God was doing something, and he didn't know exactly what, but God was doing something here, and he was just taking note of it. Something else was going on behind the scenes. 
And remember, congregation, what we said in the first point. Jacob was going to be the father of the people of Israel. We read in Genesis 35 that God not only promised to give him the land of promise, but he promised that nations, and take special note of this, and kings would come from him, from his own body. Genesis 35 verse 11 says, Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. So this is what God had promised. He promised that a king would come from Jacob's body. And now Jacob's son Joseph is having these sort of royal dreams. Dreams about ruling over the house of Israel. And so Jacob came to recognize that these dreams weren't coincidental, that there was something more to them, that God was working here. He didn't know how exactly these things would come to pass. He didn't know how exactly or what exactly God was doing, but he saw more to this than just a boy having dreams. In congregation, so what we see in this passage is we see that God is pointing to a future ruler of Jacob. God was going to fulfill his promise that he made to Jacob in Genesis 35. And as you know, later on in Genesis, this actually happens. Joseph is going to have rule and he's going to have dominion, not only just of of his own household, but of Pharaoh's household as well. He's going to rule like these great stars in heaven, a ruler who would also even bring salvation to his own people. He was the future star that God was pointing to. But that's not the only star of this passage. In, in Numbers 24, verse 7, Balaam prophesied about a star that would come from Jacob. And he's not talking about, about Joseph. He said, I see, this is, this is Numbers 24, verse 7. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Balaam wasn't speaking about Joseph. It, it's true, he, he could have been speaking of David later on, but not only just David, he was speaking, he was prophetically of Jesus, of Jesus, that bright and morning star that we read about in the book of Revelation, the one who rules on high at God's right hand. And when we, when we actually look at the ministry of Jesus, particularly his birth, we see in full what these events are foreshadowing. Congregation, soon we're going to be celebrating Christmas. And maybe you're all quite excited about that, looking forward to it in the next couple of weeks. There's a bit of anticipation. And it's all about the birth of Jesus. And let's just look at his announcement, at the announcement of his royal birth. So we read it in in Luke 1. The angel of God appears to Mary to announce his birth, and he says to her, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And then take note of this. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom, there will be no end. So God was announcing a future king born of Jacob's house. And then think about the wise men. The wise men come to Jerusalem, and what do they say in Matthew 2? They say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So brothers and sisters, this is what Mary was pondering in her heart. She was not only pondering what Jesus did in the temple, but everything up up until that point. And what's interesting is that Luke's words are exactly the same as our text So like Jacob, Mary is pondering these things in in her heart. And like Jacob, she didn't know exactly how these things would come to be, but she recognized that there was more to the little baby in her arms than just that. She recognized that God was pointing to the future ruler of Jacob, that he was pointing to the future star of Jacob. But then just like our text As Jesus' ministry moves on, we see that many failed to see that. And they failed to see it. Why? Because of selfish ambition and jealousy. Throughout his ministry, you have the teachers of the Scriptures, the Pharisees of the law, failed to recognize that he was just more than a carpenter, more than a man from Nazareth. 
And, and they were jealous of him. They were jealous of his teaching. They were jealous of his popularity. They were jealous of his influence. They even say to one another, see, the whole world is going after him. We got to get rid of him or else we're going to lose our position and we're going to lose our place that the Romans have given us. And so they saw nothing more in him. Their jealousy kept them in their blindness. As Jesus say, though they thought they saw, they were actually blind. And so their sin was even greater. Instead of bowing and kissing the king of Bethlehem, they didn't even acknowledge him. But instead, driven out of jealousy and selfish ambition, they drove him to the cross and killed him there. And what's interesting is is Pilate notices that. He knows that. And we're told that in Matthew 27, verse 18. Pilate knew that it was because of jealousy that the Pharisees brought Jesus to him to crucify him. Their jealousy kept them in their blindness. Beloved congregation, this passage warns us. It warns us against allowing jealousy and ambition to gain a foothold into our lives. Because the story of Joseph shows that it is toxic, that it's blinding. It blinds us to the point that we're, no, that we're no longer able to see what Jesus is doing right in front of us. That we're not able to see his life-giving work going on before our eyes. You see, God was busy in the life of Joseph. But the brothers, caught up in their jealousy, didn't see it. And the same thing happened in the life of Jesus. God was powerfully at work in front of his people, right before their very eyes, And the leaders and people caught up in their their zealousness and jealous. They didn't even see it. They were blind. Beloved, sometimes that also happens to us in the church of God. Sometimes we become jealous of a brother or sister. Maybe we're jealous of their position. Maybe we're jealous of their influence, their good character. Or maybe we're jealous of the relationship that they have. Whatever we're jealous of. Our jealousy can be so great that we can fail to recognize what God is doing in and through that person for his church. And in our envy and our jealousy, what we do is we try to discredit them. We try to show everybody that they're not quite as great as everybody thinks them to be. And we try to tear them down. But then what we fail to see is that God is working powerfully in front of us. And because of our jealousy, we have blinders on our eyes and we don't even see it. So congregation, beware. Beware of jealousy and its blinding power. Because God may be doing something right in front of you, but you don't have a vision to see it. And lastly, this passage gives us great comfort. So think back to the first readers of our text. Now we mentioned that those were the Israelites traveling through the wilderness. So think about those Israelites. They knew the rest of the story of Joseph. They they knew what was going on. They, they could jump to the, the next part and read about how he was lifted up into Pharaoh's house. So they knew that there was more going on. They knew that there was a backstage, you could say. And so with the benefit of hindsight, they could see that despite all the dysfunction that was going on there, that God was indeed fulfilling his promises to his people. And so they, they as children of Jacob, they could be comforted that despite what was going on in the wilderness, despite what they were experiencing as they were heading towards the promised land, they could be certain that there was a backstage, that God was indeed behind the scenes fulfilling His promise to them, that promise to give them the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the same is true for us today. Sometimes we can be overwhelmed, as, as Rodney preached about last Sunday. We can be overwhelmed about the mess that we see in the church of Christ. And not only that, about the mess that we see in the church, but also the mess we see in our own lives. Because what do we see? We see jealousy. We see envy. We see dysfunctional families. We see, we see marriages that are struggling. We see struggles with addictions. We see hatred. Isn't it true that we see all those different things? But what our text is telling us is that there's a backstage to everything. That there is more going on behind the scenes than what we see. That our amazing God is actually busy, even in the messiness of the life, of the life that we have, even in the messiness of the church, to accomplish 
his promises for us in the gospel. And what are those promises? What's those beautiful promises of forgiveness, of reconciliation, of sanctifying us, of making us pure and holy? And we see this clearly at Christmas, don't we? If you think about the situation that Israel is in at the, at the time when Jesus was born, you had so much turmoil, there was so much unrest, because the, the Israelites, the Jews, they had been under the oppression of Rome for, for centuries, or even under the oppression of the Greeks. They, they'd been trying to hold on with everything they could to their identity. They were, they were close to losing it. And then even in that space, God was working. Jesus comes as this little boy. The star appears over Bethlehem. And God is announcing the star of Jacob that had come, the great king, Jesus. And so, brothers and sisters, take heart when you see messiness in the church, when you see messiness even in your own life. Take heart that there's more than what is going on than just dysfunction, that there's more going on in your life than just that and in the life of the church, that God is is at work fulfilling his promises to one day present you, to present us as a church, holy and blameless to his, his beautiful bridegroom, Jesus Christ, at his coming. So beloved, amid all this mess, have vision. Have vision that there is indeed a backstage. And as we celebrate Christmas, realize that that is what it is. It's about Jesus, the future king who has come. God is at work. He was at work and is at work in the dysfunction of not only the lives of his people, but also your life. Our sin cannot thwart his promises for us. The sun of righteousness will rise. The bright and morning star will appear. May he come quickly. Amen.